In all parts of the world, beautiful and well-designed tablewares play an important part in family and social life. From breakfast time onwards, the enjoyment of every meal, however simple, however formal it may be, is influenced by their presence. Unobtrusively, yet decisively, contribute to the arts of hospitality and gracious living. During the 136 years since their foundation, the Royal Delton Potteries have built up a worldwide reputation for wares of fine craftsmanship and good design. Today, when so many of the things we use are bulk produced, and the human element is being superseded more and more by the machine, Royal Dalton is an outstanding and welcome exception. Made from English West Country clays, without their equal anywhere in the world, by craftsmen who have inherited the rich traditions of Burslem, mother town of the English potteries, Royal Dalton enables every housewife and hostess to use and enjoy fine tablewares of the same inherent quality as those supplied to royal households. To illustrate the painstaking care and attention to every detail which lies behind each finished piece of Royal Dalton dinnerware, let us take a comparatively inexpensive pattern. This Malvern pattern on the Stafford shape and follow it through some of its principal stages of production. From his studio at the Burslem Works, the chief designer leads and inspires the work of a resident team of designers, modelers and craftsmen, each outstanding in his own field. He needs to possess a sound knowledge of ceramic materials and production processes and a wide vision. For whatever his personal preferences may be, he has to remember that tastes vary not only in different markets of the world, but even in subsections of the same market. Therefore, before a new design is finally approved, much time must be spent in market research, and every detail of the original drawings showing the shapes and sizes of the various pieces which make up a set of tableware is discussed thoroughly with both sales and production departments. When all these details are settled, the drawings go to the modeler. His task is to produce the original plaster models from which the working models and molds will be made. In doing this, he must allow for the considerable shrinkage that will take place when the ware is dried and fired. Let us see how the modeler reproduces the Stafford plate in the plaster medium. The preliminary round shape is measured and marked to indicate where the plaster must be cut away. Then, using various special tools, the modeler proceeds, stage by stage, to evolve a perfect interpretation in every minute detail of the designer's original conception. The modeler is a highly skilled craftsman. His dexterity and exactitude are the outcome of years of training and experience. From the original model, working models and moulds are made. A great number of moulds are required, for each is used a limited number of times to ensure perfect reproduction of the original design. Specially prepared plaster is poured into the cases in which the working models have been inserted. After allowing sufficient time for setting, the outer casing is removed and the mould, giving a copy of the model in reverse, is then placed in a special drying chamber, the temperature and humidity of which are carefully controlled 
to ensure that it will be in perfect condition for use in the subsequent production processes. An important factor in the production of fine dinnerware is the quality of the raw materials used to make the body, which is the name given to the final mixture of different clays and other ingredients such as finely ground china stone, feldspar, flint and bone ash. The ingredients vary according to the type of body, whether for example it is to be of the opaque or the translucent type. From each consignment of raw materials Samples are taken for testing in the laboratory. After the different ingredients have been prepared, they are blended in their exact proportions in vast mixing arcs, forming a liquid of creamy consistency known as slip. Samples of this are also tested at regular intervals. In the laboratories, a pilot plant enables the technicians to reproduce factory processes in miniature. For science plays a vital part in the modern pottery industry, and the Dalton Ceramic Research Laboratories are constantly engaged in experimental work on new bodies, glazes and colours. From the mixing arcs, the liquid slip is forced by powerful pumps through a series of fine mesh screens and then over electromagnets to remove any small particles of iron, the presence of which would discolour the wear when fired. The liquid then flows into storage tanks where it is kept constantly in motion. The slip is pumped from the storage tanks into large filter presses, divided into sections by fine mesh cloths, through which the mixture is forced. Surplus water is thus removed, leaving behind thin sheets of blended plastic material. The body is still not ready for use, but has to undergo further processing in a machine known as a pug mill. This is a kind of mincing machine which compresses the clay and cuts it with revolving knives, at the same time removing all air. Thus producing a homogeneous mixture of just the right consistency and texture for the potter to use. This long and careful preparation of the clay plays a most essential part in achieving the strength and durability of Royal Dalton tablewares. Finally, the clay emerges from the pug mill and is cut up into suitable slabs for conveying to the making shops. The plate making machine is called a jigger. It is a modern power driven development from the traditional potter's wheel which has been in use for many thousands of years. It is fascinating to watch a skilled plate maker at work and to see how his every action is performed with that seemingly effortless ease which is the outcome of long experience. A piece of clay is flattened out on a revolving wheel producing a circular shape known as a bat. The plate maker then places this bat over a plaster mould which is firmly centred on a second wheel. The mould imparts the shape of the top of the plate and the underneath is shaped by compressing a steel profile.
Each hour, a newly formed plate is removed from the mould and carefully tested to see that it conforms in all respects to the standard demanded. Another example of the high degree of control exercised at every stage of production. After drying sufficiently to be removed from the mould and handled without risk of damage, the plate, still unfired, goes through two finishing processes called in the potteries towing and fettling. The object of these is to ensure that the surfaces and edges are made perfectly smooth. Each piece is then lightly rubbed over with a sponge to remove any adhering particles of dust. At the same time, it is carefully inspected, and if it shows the slightest flaw, it is rejected. Cups in the Stafford shape are made in a somewhat similar way. Clay is inserted in a hollow plaster mould which forms the outside. A metal profile is pulled down to shape the inside of the cup to the exact thickness required. The top of each cup is carefully trimmed. Then, when sufficiently firm, the cup is removed from the mould and is smoothed and finished before going on to the next process. Handles for cups are made separately in plaster moulds one mould sufficing for a number of handles. These are removed and each one trimmed in a special machine. The cup handler uses liquid clay to make the handles adhere. This handling process although it may appear a comparatively simple affair, really calls for considerable judgment as to the correct angle for fixing and just the right degree of pressure to ensure a strong join. After further drying and inspection, the cups are made ready for their first firing, known as the biscuit firing. Each plate is carefully bedded in a material which allows uniform and progressive contraction as the firing temperature slowly rises. Plates, cups and other articles are stacked on trucks in tiers formed by fireproof supports and slabs. When each truck has been fully loaded, it is passed slowly through a long gas-fired tunnel oven, divided into various zones in which the temperature rises gradually to a peak of intense heat, 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, and then steadily falls again. The progress of each truck through the oven is recorded automatically, and the temperature cycle checked at each stage. After a period of over 50 hours, the fired ware emerges at the other end of the oven having shrunk considerably during the process. Once again, every piece of ware is re-examined to make sure that it has been correctly fired to the high standard required.
So far, we have confined our attention to the design and production of the shape. Let us now return to the studio where the designer's conception of the Malvern pattern to go on the Stafford shape is receiving its finishing touches. The relationship between shape and decoration is, of course, all important. There must be perfect harmony between them. The Malvern is a finely detailed floral design based on the best Staffordshire traditions. The main outlines are deeply engraved on metal cylinders and plates. Because of the intricacy of the work, the engraver needs a strong magnifying glass to follow the movement of the sharp steel tools used to incise the pattern. This engraving process is another example of painstaking craftsmanship. Colour mixed with oil is pressed into the engraved lines to enable prints to be transferred to strong tissue paper. When it comes from the printing machine, the paper bears a clear colour imprint of the pattern in outline. Superfluous paper is trimmed away and the various portions of the pattern cut to suit the particular pieces of the dinnerware to which they are to be applied. The tissue is then applied carefully to the wear. The stamp or trademark is applied in a similar way. The colour is made to adhere firmly to the wear by the use of an ingenious machine which applies just the right amount of pressure. This is another example of the Royal Dalton policy of using modern machinery wherever possible to eliminate laborious work without detriment to the quality of the finished product. The tissue is then washed away from the wear, leaving the coloured outline of the Malvern pattern adhering firmly and evenly, for the pigment itself is impervious to water. After further inspection comes the next process, that of painting the delicate details of the floral design. This is entirely hand done by trained artists. It calls for a steady hand, a sure eye, and true artistic appreciation. Note the careful shading and the exact brush strokes which characterize hand painting such as this. Have you ever wondered how those narrow lines are applied to the handles of cups? Here you see the answer. It looks simple enough, but it takes long practice to do it efficiently. The Malvern pattern on the Stafford shape is, of course, only one of a most extensive range. Let us spend a few minutes, therefore, watching some other patterns in process of decoration. The artist works smoothly and deftly in a quiet, studio-like atmosphere very different indeed from the clamour and rush of a factory in which bulk production is the aim. After the oil used to mix the colours has been burned out in a special type of kiln, all this beautiful decoration is destined to disappear beneath a uniform coating of glaze. The glazer, or dipper as he is often called, deftly twirls and handles the plate to ensure an absolutely even coating. In his own field, he is every bit as much a craftsman as the engraver or painter. Although the glaze now appears opaque, it will be transformed by the next firing, the glossed firing, 
into an impermeable, transparent and glass-like film, revealing the full beauty of the pattern beneath. In arranging the wear on the trucks, great care is taken to separate each piece from its neighbours, for if two were to touch, they would be fused by the intense heat needed to vitrify the glaze and wed it indissolubly to the wear. The trucks are passed through another long tunnel oven, similar in principle to the one we saw previously. At last, our Malvern plate emerges from the oven and after further inspection in the finished warehouse, will be ready to go to the packers. The lifeless, inert clays and minerals and the dull, flat ceramic pigments have been transformed by the alchemy of the potter's craft into a thing of lustrous beauty, depicting a colourful bouquet of English flowers. Before we leave the Royal Dalton Pottery at Burslem, let us watch some other patterns being decorated. These pieces of translucent bone china have already been glazed and the painting is being done with special enamel colours on the glazed surface. Certain decorations may call for two, three or even more additional firings to achieve the effect desired by the ceramic designer. Overglaze, that is on glaze decoration, enables the artist to use a wider palette than is possible with the underglaze colours. Each type of decoration has, however, its own special charm and appeal. Notice, of course, that plates and other pieces of tableware often have a gold line round the edge. Applying such a line to a fluted shape, like this Chatsworth pattern, calls for its own particular skill. Here is one of Dalton's veteran artists, Percy Kernock, at work on a beautiful hand-painted plate a reproduction of one of Corot's well-known landscapes. And here is a glimpse of an intricate and rich style of decoration known as raised gilding. For this, the finest quality gold is used, applied with a pencil brush. When fired and burnished, this gives a brilliant lasting luster. To conclude our visit, let us examine a number of finished pieces taken from the Royal Dalton showroom. These form but a small selection from the extensive range available, and to appreciate them to the full, they really need to be handled as well as seen, for beautiful dinnerware has its appeal not only to the eye, but also to the sense of touch. Each design possesses individuality and character. The colourings are superb, and the quality is of the highest. They include the traditional and the modern. They range from the gay and floral to the simple and restrained, representing the best that long experience in the dinnerware field can offer. Almost from the first days of craftsman pottery, the man who made a beautiful piece signed it with his name. It was a proof of pride in his handiwork. And so gradually, buyers have become accustomed to look for a name. At first it was perhaps an individual one, then, with the growth of the pottery industry, the name came to represent a group of craftsmen, a symbol of experienced men and women working together, yet each retaining the individuality so necessary to preserve an enduring tradition of good design and fine quality.
It is this tradition that lies behind the symbol of Royal Dalton. 